Psychology Shorts Introducing Eric Byrne. Eric Bernstein grew up in Montreal, Canada. His father was a doctor and his mother a writer. He graduated from McGill University in 1935 with a medical degree and trained to be a psychoanalyst at Yale University. He became a U.S. citizen, worked at Mount Zion Hospital in New York, and in 1943 changed his name to Eric Byrne. During the Second World War Byrne worked as a U.S. Army psychiatrist, and afterwards resumed his studies under Eric Erickson at the San Francisco Psychoanalytic Institute. Settling in California in the late 1940s, he became disenchanted with psychoanalysis, and his work on ego states evolved over the next decade into transactional analysis. He formed the International Transactional Analysis Association, and combined private practice with consulting and hospital posts. Byrne wrote on a range of subjects. In addition to his other bestseller, What Do You Say After You Say Hello? 1975, which examined the idea of life scripts, he also published The Layman's Guide to Psychiatry and Psychoanalysis, 1957, Structure and Dynamics of Organizations and Groups, 1963, Sex in Human Loving, 1970, and, posthumously, Beyond Games and Scripts, 1976. See also the biography by Elizabeth Watkins Jorgensen, Eric Byrne, Master Gamesman, 1984. Byrne admitted that he had a well-developed child, once describing himself as a 56-year-old teenager. He was a keen poker player, was married three times, and died in 1970. In 1961, psychiatrist Eric Byrne published a book with a very boring title, Transactional Analysis in Psychotherapy. It became the foundation work in its field, was much referenced, and was a reasonable seller. Three years later he published a sequel based on the same concepts but with a more colloquial feel. With its brilliant title and witty, amusing categories of human motivation, games people play was bound to attract more attention. Sales for the initial print run of 3,000 copies were slow, but two years later, Thanks mostly to word of mouth and some modest advertising, the book had sold 300,000 copies in hardback. It spent two years on the New York Times bestseller list, unusual for a nonfiction work, and creating a template for future writers who suddenly got wealthy by writing a pop psychology bestseller. The 50 something Byrne bought a new house and a Maserati and remarried. Though he did not realize it at the time, games people play. The psychology of human relationships marked the beginning of the popular psychology boom, as distinct from mere self-help on the one hand and academic psychology on the other. Mainstream psychologists looked down on Byrne's book as shallow and pandering to the public, but in fact the first 50 or 60 pages are written in a rather serious, scholarly style. Only in the second part does the tone lighten up, and this is the section most people bought the book for. Today, Games People Play has sold over 5 million copies and the phrase in its title has entered the English idiom. Strokes and Transactions Burn began by noting research that infants, if deprived of physical handling, often fall into irreversible mental and physical decline. He pointed to other studies suggesting that sensory deprivation in adults can lead to temporary psychosis. Adults need physical contact as much as children but it is not always available so we compromise, instead seeking symbolic emotional strokes from others. A movie star, for instance, may get his strokes from hundreds of adoring weekly fan letters, while a scientist may get hers from a single positive commendation from a leading figure in the field. Byrne defined the stroke as the fundamental unit of social action. An exchange of strokes is a transaction, hence his creation of the phrase transactional analysis, to describe the dynamics of social interaction. Why we play games. Given the need to receive strokes, Byrne observed that in biological terms human beings consider any social intercourse even if negative as better than none at all. This need for intimacy is also why people engage in games. These become a substitute for genuine contact. He defined a game as an ongoing series of complementary ulterior transactions progressing to a well-defined, predictable outcome. We play a game to satisfy some hidden motivation, and it always involves a payoff. 
Most of the time people are not aware they are playing games. It is just a normal part of social interaction. Games are a lot like playing poker. When we hide our real motivations as part of a strategy to achieve the payoff, to win money. In the work environment the payoff may be getting the deal. People speak of being in the real estate game, or the insurance game, or playing the stock market, an unconscious recognition that their work involves a series of maneuvers to achieve a certain gain. And in close relationships, the payoff usually involves some emotional satisfaction or increase in control. The three selves transactional analysis evolved out of Freudian psychoanalysis, which Byrne had studied and practiced. He had once had an adult male patient who admit Ted that he was really a little boy in an adult's clothing. In subsequent sessions, Byrne asked him whether it was now the little boy talking or the adult. From these and other experiences, Byrne came to the view that within each person are three selves or ego states that often contradict each other. They are characterized by 1. The attitudes and thinking of a parental figure, parent, 2. The adult like rationality, objectivity, and acceptance of the truth, adult, 3. The stances and fixations of a child, child. The three selves correspond loosely to Freud's superego, parent, ego, adult, and id, child. In any given social interaction, Byrne argued, we exhibit one of these basic parent, adult, and child states, and can easily shift from one to the other. For instance, we can take on the child's creativity, curiosity, and charm, but also the child's tantrums or intransigence. Within each mode we can be productive or unproductive. In playing a game with someone we take on an aspect of one of the three selves. Instead of remaining neutral, genuine, or intimate, to get what we want we may feel the need to act like a commanding parent, or a coquettish child, or to take on the sage-like, rational aura of an adult. Let the games begin. The main part of the book is a thesaurus of the many games people play, such as the following. If it weren't for you, this is the most common game played between spouses, in which one partner complains that the other is an obstacle to doing what they really want in life. Byrne suggested that most people unconsciously choose spouses because they want certain limits placed on them. He gave an example of a woman who seemed desperate to learn to dance. The problem was that her husband hated going out, so her social life was restricted. She enrolled in dancing classes, but found that she was terribly afraid of dancing in public and dropped out. Byrne's point was that what we blame the other partner for is more often revealed as an issue within ourselves. Playing, if it weren't for you, allows us to divest ourselves of responsibility for facing our fears or shortcomings. Why don't you? Yes, but this game begins when someone states a problem in their life, and another person responds by offering constructive suggestions on how to solve it. The subject says, yes, but, and proceeds to find issue with the solutions. In adult mode, we would examine and probably take on board a solution but this is not the purpose of the exchange. It allows the subject to gain sympathy from others in their inadequacy to meet the situation, child mode. The problem solvers, in turn, get the opportunity to play wise parent. Wooden leg. Someone playing this game will have the defensive attitude of, what do you expect of a person with a wooden leg? Bad childhood. Neurosis. Alcoholism. Some feature of themselves is used an excuse for lack of competence or motivation, so that they do not have to take full responsibility for their life. Burns' other games include Life Games, Now I've Got You, You Son of a Bitch, See What You Made Me Do, Marital Games, Frigid Woman, Look How Hard I've Tried, Good Games, Homely Sage, They'll Be Glad They Knew Me. Each game has a thesis, its basic premise, and how that is played out and an antithesis, the way it reaches its conclusion, with one of the players taking an action that in their mind makes them the winner. The games we play, Byrne said, are like worn-out loops of tape we inherit from childhood and continue to let roll. Though limiting and destructive, they are also a sort of comfort, absolving us of the need to confront unresolved psychological issues. For some, playing games has become a basic part of who they are.
Many people feel the need to get into fights with those closest to them or intrigues with their friends in order to stay interested. However, Byrne warned, if we play too many bad games for too long, they become self-destructive. The more games we play, the more we expect others to play them too. A relentless game player can end up a psychotic who reads too much of their own motivations and biases into others' behavior. Final comments though games people play was reviled by many practicing psychiatrists as too, pop, and inane. Transactional analysis continues to be influential and has been added to the armory of many psychotherapists and counselors who need to deal with difficult or evasive patients. It seemed like a groundbreaking book because it brought a psychologist's precision to an area that was normally the preserve of novelists and playwrights. Indeed, American novelist Kurt Vonnegut wrote a celebrated review that suggested its contents could inspire creative writers for years. Be aware that games people play is quite Freudian, with many of the games based on Freud's ideas about inhibition, sexual tension, and unconscious impulses. It is also clearly a relic of the 1960s in its language and social attitudes. Yet it can still be a mind-opening read, and is a classic for the simple insight that people always have and probably always will play games. As Byrne noted, we teach our children all the pastimes, rituals, and procedures they need to adapt to our culture and get by in life, and we spend a lot of time choosing their schools and activities, yet we don't teach them about games an unfortunate but realistic feature of the dynamics of every family and institution. Games people play can seem to offer an unnecessarily dark view of human nature. However, this was not Burns' intention. He remarked that we can all leave game playing behind if we know there is an alternative. As a result of childhood experiences we leave behind the natural confidence, spontaneity, and curiosity we had as a child and instead adopt the parents' ideas of what we can or cannot do. Through greater awareness of the three selves, we can get back to a state of being more comfortable within our own skin. No longer do we feel that we need someone's permission to succeed, and we become unwilling to substitute games for real intimacy. Thank you for listening. Please leave a like, subscribe and share this audiobook. Please keep tuned for more Roger Kimsky video.